friends good evening to this month and today and we have a we are privileged to have uh, sumeru roy chaudhary and uh, akhil bakshi talking to us on the life of neta ji shubhash chandra bose more important to talk about his mysterious uh, what they think is mysterious about the air crash in taiwan we are deeply privileged to have dr anita pfaff uh, netaji's daughter who lives in germany and uh, we thank you for uh, being part of today's event start to all of you uh, and thank you very much shumeru ji for your very erudite and uh, extensive um explanation of the situation uh i concur with you on practically everything that you said uh so meru let me begin this conversation by saying how impressed i am with the exhaustive and meticulous research you have done for writing this book you went through thousands of pages of reports documents witness testimonies classified and declassified files to conclusively establish that netaji subhash chandra bose indeed died of injuries suffered in the plane crash in taiwan on august 18 1945 you have also provided solid and concrete evidence to disprove the theories uh, rather stories of those who claimed that netaji did not meet his end on that fateful day and continued to live in russia china tibet india under various identities your book leaves no room for any controversy tell me what moved you to write this book netaji of gumnami and how long did it take namaskar thank you for the appreciation uh netaji has been my idol of patriotism since childhood my parents believe and we did too that netaji escaped from southeast asia and was killed by the russian but they were not sure then when i was at high school emerged sholomari sadhu as netaji in north bengal in the first half of 1960s i followed avidly all the development reported in the newspaper i witnessed how the entire story that the sadhu was netaji was ultimately squashed hmm. so the russian story continued again then much later it was in 2013 when i was approached by a proponent of another new story gumnami baba is netaji and the person tried to persuade me to accept the finding i rubbish the story on its face value as what he was he was telling me about gumnami baba was totally opposite to netaji's character can you imagine netaji spending 40 years in hiding from his own countrymen but mm. serving china vietnam korea and not bothering about the partition of his motherland riots starvation internal emergency he remained inert when his captured army officers his colleagues his generals were sent for court martial and hundreds of his soldiers massacred in one night at nilganj near barakpur kolkata mm. can this man be netaji the story of gumnami is nothing but an insult and denigration of netaji i had the direct knowledge of 1960s sholomari sadhu episode behind me then my rejection of the gumnami story provoked unexpected attacks against me on social media mm. the word troll was not in vogue those days but now i can understand i was being trolled with abuses of the filthiest order no. and was threatened to now but this triggered the passion in me to do a serious study on the mortal end of netaji the declassification of remaining netaji files in 
by the government came as a boon. The study led to the conclusion that Netaji indeed died in a plane crash in, on 18th August 1945. I began to make public in an organized manner through my social media group the findings from the file declassified in India mm -hmm. and abroad. This helped me to serialize the flaws in the conspiracy theories on Netaji's death. I also got the opportunity to present my findings as a regular columnist on Netaji issue in web magazine and have appeared in discussion and on All India TV channels. My continuous activity in social media groups against fake and unsubstantiated narratives led to several cyber attacks on my social media account and Whoa. group. Whoa. You know, the, so, so this, uh, to save these findings, hmm. the attacks prompted me to document my findings in, in hard copy format. Okay. This book, Netaji as Gumnami, uh, Gumnami, India's uh, biggest hoax, documents all that is fake about the st story supported by official documents. In particular, it also contains photocopies of what you are telling, investigative reports prepared by the Allied forces, Japan and Taiwan, which yeah. are not easily available to the general public. The purpose mm -hmm. for this is to reach a larger number of people, especially the younger generation, in order that the attempts by the conspiracy storytellers to expand their influence are challenged and halted. Good. Earlier, I had brought out a book, Russian Theory is a Fancy, mm. where the flaws of the Russian theory is documented. Of course, mm. the Russian angle is now on the wane. Well, uh, regarding how long did, uh, did uh, my research take and the writing take, actually the ingredients were already there. Yeah. My social media group built since 2016. The last cyber attack was in January. And this uh, January this year. And then I decided to convert the data to hard copy. So this is so, uh, uh, Sumeru, now th th there were 11 investigations and inquiries that were conducted to find out whether Nedaji died or disappeared. Could you give us a synopsis of uh, their findings? Okay. Yes. There are a total of 11 in investigations and inquiries. Most of us are aware of the three inquiries conducted by India government. But hmm. well before government of India decided to carry out its first inquiry, the Allied forces had conducted several investigations on what happened to Bose, their biggest enemy. A total of six investigations were carried out by the foreign authorities. Two by the Allied forces, two by the Japanese authorities, and one by the British India government, and one by the Taiwanese government. Hmm. Now, all these six investigations were unknown to us till okay. 2016 end. I give you the brief summary of them. Oh. First, soon after Japan surrendered, they surrendered on 15th August and their declaration of Netaji's death was on 23rd August. Hmm. So soon after Japan surrendered, on August 30, 1945, Admiral Mountbatten sent a request to General MacArthur for an inquiry about the death of Netaji. Accordingly, on September 19th, within 19 days, the Japanese government submitted a preliminary report to MacArthur's office. Among other details, it hmm. stated that Bose was injured in an air crash on August 18th at Taihoku and died the same evening. This was the first report which came by uh, September 19th. We didn't know all these things till 2016. No. Next, next was the British India government's investigation. In the same month, that is September 45, the British India government sent two superintendents of police, Finney and Davis, assisted by two Indian inspectors, H.K. Roy and K.P. Zay, to Bangkok, 
Saigon and uh, Taihoku to find out both. They interrogated the in charge of the Saigon airport, mm. the military officers at Taihoku airport, and the chief medical officer of the military hospital at Taihoku. At Bangkok, they retrieved a telegram dated August 20th, 45, sent from the chief of the staff of Japan's Southern Army to Hikari Kekan. A body set up to Hikari Kekan is the body set up to liaise between the Japanese government and the Azadin government. Yeah. So they recovered a telegram which carried the message of the plane crash and Netaji's death. These two investigations were enough. I mean, they clearly concluded right. that Netaji was dead. Mm. But rumors continued in India that he was alive and would return. And the popular support for the INA veterans unnerved the British. So, few months later, in mid-46, 1946, Colonel John Figgis, a senior British intelligence officer on attachment in Tokyo, was deputed to carry out another round of investigation, that is the third of its kind, into the fate of both. Between May and July of 1946, Pegasus interrogated six Japanese officials in Tokyo, which included the Japanese doctor, Suruta, Dr. Suruta, who treated Netaji at the Nanmon Hospital, that's the military hospital's name, branch name, at Taihoku. Pegasus submitted his report on 25th July, 46 where he concluded, it is confirmed for certain that S.C. Bose died in a Taihoku military hospital on 18th August 1945. Mm. Then comes the fourth investigation. Near about the same time, Captain Alfred Turner of the War Crimes Liaison Section of Taiwan interrogated the CMO of the Nanmon Hospital, Dr. Yashumi who was then imprisoned at the Stanley Jail in Hong Kong. His testimony was recorded in October 1946, which confirmed Netaji's death on the night of 18. These are the four investigations conducted within a year of 1945. Mm, yeah. So the, the Allied forces were certain that Netaji was no more. They gave up the chase for Netaji also due to this. Then much later, in 1955, India government decided to conduct an inquiry on Netaji's death or disappearance, as you may call it. So India sought Japan's permission to conduct an inquiry on their soil. Japan, while giving the permission, submitted a detailed report to India in January 1956. This is the fifth investigative report. It comprised of interviews with 13 witnesses, mm. including Netaji's co-passengers and doctors who attended on him in the military hospital in Taihoku. Mm. There too, the findings were the same. In addition, in that report, they mentioned that Bose's cremated remains were handed over to Mr. Ayer and the retrieved articles left by Bose to Mr. Murthy on September 8, 1945, at the Imperial Headquarters in Tokyo. Hmm. At the same year, now comes the sixth report. The sixth report is the Taiwanese report. India was not having diplomatic relations with Taiwan when the Shanawas Khan committee was in session. And India could not, uh, India could not send the delegation over there. So, in June 56, India requested UK to ask the Taiwanese government to interview employees of the Nanmon Hospital and Taipei Cremation Center. The Taiwanese government sent the eyewitnesses account to the UK mission, who in turn sent it to the government of India. The mm. Taiwanese report cast mm. no doubt on the details of the crash or the subsequent death and cremation of Netaji. Yeah. Now, all these six reports were made known to us only in 2016 through de declassification of Indian files. Now, the, those are the six of the 11. And three we know the other Indian one. In addition to that, there were two private investigations. The first 
Indian investigation was conducted by Harin Shah, a war correspondent of Bombay's Free Press Journal. Hmm. Shah visited Taihoku in September 1946 and later published his findings in his book, uh, Verdict from Formosa, The Gallant End of Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose. Among many other evidences, he recorded the testimony of the nurse at the Nanmond Hospital. Her account matched with that recorded of figures in July 46. The nurse took Shah to the ward and the bed where she said, most had passed away. Hmm. As readers like, as see, we like sensational news. Yeah. So what happened when Harin Shah cabled back to his headquarters in Bombay, mm -hmm. that his finding was that Netaji died in a plane crash. His journal head cabled back to him saying, Netaji dead is no news. If he is alive, return immediately. Hire a plane. And in those days, you know, hiring a plane was an astronomical figure affair. Hmm. The journal was prepared to spend any amount if Shah could come back with a sensational story that hmm. Netaji is alive. alive. So people of those days were no different from us. <laughs> uh, at the same time, uh, in 1953, members of the Indian Independence League in short, okay. IIL. The, uh, IIL was the civil administrative wing of the Azad Hind government. They published an investigative report in two parts. Based on their investigation was based on hmm. circumstantial evidence and individual contacts they had, okay. which they carried out in the past several years, hmm. up to 1953. The IIL members also came to the conclusion that there was a plane crash and Netaji died of the injuries from it. So the, these are the eight investigations by six foreign authorities and two privately by Indian. The remaining three are the inquiries conducted by the Indian government, which most of us know. But still, I'll just run through them. Okay. I'll give you an... The six foreign investigations actually were not known to us. And obviously... Demand for an official probe into the fate of Netaji continued to grow in India. And in 1956, the government formed the Netaji Inquiry Committee. The purpose was to inquire into the circumstances concerning the departure of Netaji. This is what is written over there. From mm -hmm. Bangkok, about the 16th of uh, August 1955, his alleged death as a result of an aircraft accident. The committee consisted of Shah Nawaz Khan, who was a former major general of the INA. Yeah. He was court martialed and sentenced to death by the British in 1946, which was later commuted. In 56, he was then the parliamentary secretary. The other in the committee, others in the committee were Netaji's older brother, Suresh Chandra Bose and Ace and Maitra of the Indian Civil Service. The Shahnavas Khan Committee findings are a voluminous work, digitized and now available in the public domain. The committee examined 67 witnesses, including 11 eyewitnesses, who confirmed Netaji's death as a result of burn injury. They cross-examined five of the six persons who had accompanied mm -hmm. Netaji on his last flight from Bangkok including Habibur Rahman. The committee could not visit Taiyoku, as I told you, the crash site, and as, as India did not have diplomatic relations. But the final report was not unanimous. The majority report signed by Shahnawaz Khan and Maitra was accepted by the parliament, which concluded, like the previously mentioned eight investigation, that Netaji died as a result of a plane crash at Taihoku on 18th August, 45. The committee was criticized for not visiting Taihoku. And in addition to that, the appearance of a Saradananda Sadhu at Shavalomari Ashram in North Bengal no. in the 60s, who okay. many believed to be Netaji incognito, hmm. led to the persistent demand for further inquiry. So people were not satisfied 
with the Shahnawaz committee report as Tardananda Sadhu, the Shaulamari Sadhu in short come. So in 1970, the government formed the Justice Koshla Commission under retired Justice G.D. Koshla. Mm. And their purpose was to inquire into all the facts and circumstances relating to the disappearance of Netaji in 1945. Okay. Okay. So, but unsurprisingly, nothing new came out of the Khosla mm. Commission. Justice Khosla interviewed four of the uh, four of Netaji's co-passengers and five eyewitnesses to the crash. Over a period of four years, the uh, committee continued. Uh, the commission continued. He also interviewed Shahnawaz Khan, Suresh Bose, and 224 other witnesses. He concluded, like the others before him, that Netaji had been grievously injured by the aircraft crash at Taihoku and died the same night. Yet, the Khosla Commission also patiently recorded new sightings of Bose. Here started all the new sightings of Bose of an MP's chance meeting with Netaji at Marseille Airport in 1946, of an ardent admirer of Bose, a bureaucrat, who claimed that a Soviet army officer saw a well-dressed Bose publicly going to the Kremlin with high dignitaries on 24th December of 1956. And in contrast, another MP claiming that Bose languishing in, languishing in cell number 45 of a prison right. in Siberia. See what contrast. All these things. Uh, so there are 224. All this bakwas was being recorded. Still others submitted photographs purportedly showing both visiting Peking in 1952 with mm. the Mongolian trade union delegation. All these things you will find in my book. And in the yeah, same okay. year, a socialist party member meeting Netaji dressed as a Burmese monk at mm. the Zengun's Inyar Lake. As story upon fantastic story piled up, Justice Mukherjee rightly wondered to what extent fantasy and perversion of truth can proceed. Now, coming to the last, the 11th of the inquiries. Now, even after these direct inquiries by government, many Indians could not accept their findings. So in 1999, more than half a century after the incident, Government appointed a third commission led by retired Justice Manoj Mukherjee to find out whether Subhash Chandra Bose is dead or alive. Number two, if he is dead, whether he died in the plane crash. Number three, whether the ashes at Renkoji are of Netaji. Mm. Number four, whether he has died in any other manner at any other place when and how. And the fifth one, if he is alive, his whereabouts. This commission interviewed 131 persons, but only one in Japan. No. You know, yet, but 20 from Faizabad, mm. another seven from Lucknow and Kanpur. So these figures somewhat give you, give away the in the intention. Okay. The commission concluded that Netaji did not die in plane crash. Therefore, the ashes of Netaji at uh, the Renkoji temple cannot be of Netaji. But Justice Mukherjee could not answer the main purpose of the inquiry. That is, if not in plane crash, how else, when, and where Netaji died? He couldn't answer, answer that. Thus, government rejected the Mukherjee Commission report after two days of discussion in both houses of parliament in May and July 2006, where 13 MPs from 12 different parties participated. Yet, many people wrongly propagate that the Mukherjee Commission was rejected, Mukherjee Commission was rejected by the government without assigning any reason. What a lie they spread. Mm. This propaganda, to what extent is mischievous you can now understand. Besides, many of Mukherjee's findings were based on flawed assumptions. If time permits, I can give you the details of his okay. flawed assumptions later. 
All right. Okay. Uh, let me just uh, get back to the Shah Nawaz Commission of 1956, which you said was, you know, one of the first uh, government-appointed committees to investigate right. what the rumors about Dataji being alive. Now, this commission, as you said, concluded that Dataji had indeed died as a result of the plane crash. Now, you also mentioned that one of the three members of this uh, committee was Dataji's elder brother, S.C. Bose, right? Yeah. But tell me, uh, Mr. Bose, he signed the draft report, which concluded, you know, that Netaji had died. But later, he changes his mind and refuses to sign the final report. Why did he change his mind? See, why Suresh Chandra Bose changed his mind can somewhat be deduced from the dissent report he placed two months after the final report was tabled in Parliament mm. by Shahnawaz Khan and Mike Tarr. But before that, we need to be aware of the facts. Depositions and cross-examinations of the witnesses and study of all official records by Shahnawaz Committee mm. ended in June 1956. That is, by June 1956, the inquiry was over. And on conclusion of the inquiry, the committee prepared a three-page draft report, which uh, you just mentioned. Hmm. The committee prepared a three-page draft report titled Principal Points Agreed To. And the, what were the principal points agreed to? One was there had been an air crash at Taihoku on 18th August 45, in which Netaji met his death, that he was cremated there and the ashes lying in the Renkoji temple in Tokyo are held. All three members of the committee, including Suresh Chandra Bose, signed this draft report on 2nd July 56. Mm. I think if it can be shown that that draft report where Suresh Chandra Bose uh, signed the principal points of agreement, if that can be shown. Uh, otherwise, so you got it. He had signed the principal points of agreement. Yeah. But strangely, soon after signing the draft report, Suresh Bose took a different view and did not sign the final report. The final report signed by Khan and Maitro was submitted on 3rd August, mm -hmm. and the parliament accepted the majority decision in September. Now, Suresh Bose, after signing the draft report and without examining any other person or going through any new document, prepared a decent report which he submitted okay. on 9th October. All right. Okay. The dissent report was placed in the parliament in November. That too was placed in the parliament. Many say mm. it, was, it was not placed. That is also a wrong propaganda. The dissent report had two broad features. One is allegation and two is contradiction in the deposition. Mm. So what are the allegations? He makes allegations and charges of impropriety against various people, mainly Jawaharlal Nehru, Shah Nawaz Khan, and to mm -hmm. some lesser extent, his, com uh, his committee colleague, S.N. Maitra, then the chief minister of uh, West Bengal, Dr. B.C. Yeah. Roy, then bureaucrats T.N. Call and S.K. Roy. Then he then questions, in, in this recent report, he, he questions the composition of the committee. Mm -hmm. He, he participated, but then he questions the composition of the committee. So these things, uh, when it hits our eye, I mean, he alleged that Shah Nawaz was unscrupulous and biased. He uses this word. He complains harassment, obstruction, and pressure on him regarding his accommodation in Delhi. Okay. And these are the allegations, uh, a personal thing. And the second, on the uh, contradictions, he details out mainly four contradictions in the deposition that, according to him, goes to prove that there was no air crash. No. What, was the, what are those four contradictions? That is, one is the height from which the plane fell. According to him, as seven witnesses gave different heights from which the plane fell, he concluded that there was no takeoff, thus no crash. The fact is that it was rather naive to ask such questions to the passengers. 
one should have some idea of the plane. They were in a bomber. These planes had no windows. They were all sitting on the ground. It had just the pilot's 180 degree window and the dorsal turret above. Except pilots, all passengers were squatting on the floor. There was no chance of the passengers seeing the outside hmm. to get an idea of the height. For yeah. example, in a conventional closed elevator, can you guess which floor you are at, 4th or 40th, unless you see the indicator? So it was pointless to consider the discrepancies mentioned by the passengers inside. Hmm. Rather, the two ground engineers who were, uh, who were outside, their figures somehow were near about. Second was, discrepancy he said, is the type of vehicle that carried Netaji from airport to the hospital. Some of the witnesses reported that Netaji was taken in a lorry. Others say he was taken in a shidosha, a typical Japanese lorry used for starting aeroplane propeller. No. This discrepancy, he said, was unexpected from army men. Therefore, Suresh Bose says that they, this indicates that they were making up stories and thus crash never happened. The third discrepancy he points out is the time of death. Yes. Hmm. The time narrated by different persons, the doctors, the nurses, the medical orderly, the interpreter, all give the death time from between 8 p.m. and 11 p.m. And this shows hmm. that the evidence is worthless. He concludes and concocted to support the secret plan between the Japanese and Netaji to announce Netaji's death. But he gives no evidence of any secret plan. Then the fourth one is regarding the watch, which Netaji was supposed to uh, was wearing. Yeah. Rahman handed over a rectangular watch to Bhulawai Desai, saying the watch was passed to him by Dr. Yoshimi, the CMO of the hospital, as the belonging of Netaji. Mm. But Photograph, all photograph evidence show that Netaji always wore a round watch. Okay. So Suresh was concluded, Habibul was lying. Mm. Besides this, he writes, there was a plan for Netaji to escape along with General Shidai to Manchuria, who was mm. his co-passenger. And on reaching there, the Japanese would declare that Netaji had died. But he <coughs> produces nothing in support of this assumption. Rather, mm -hmm. he misinterprets what SAIR, one of the Netaji's initial co-passengers, yeah. deposed to the committee. He, he misinterprets. He mentions names of several Japanese, but none of them deposed that there was a pre-plan that they would declare Netaji dead. I mean, there's no proof that it is all assumption. Today's Bush also opined the fact that the British India government which sent a team to Southeast Asia in September, the second investigation which I mentioned. The British India government, the team they sent, they sent uh, to arrest Netaji mm. after the news of death. They could not find Netaji even after scouring the entire area. That proves that Netaji had escaped somewhere else. All right. That's what Suresh Bosch uh, gotcha. in his dissent report. And he has another thing also, he assumed that Netaji was declared an international war criminal, which was incorrect. Mm. Mm. And he was convinced that Rahman was under an oath of secrecy. This has been exploited extensively. It is being exploited extensively till now. He was convinced that Rahman was under an oath of secrecy, but produces no evidence in support of his conviction. All right. Uh, now you you, uh, you you you've been speaking of these witnesses. Now who were the eyewitnesses of the plane crash and of Netaji's death who deposed before the inquiry commissions? And did all uh, the three Indian appointed uh, uh, commissions interrogate them? Yeah, uh, I'll let you know. The C, the Shanawas committee was held eleven years after the incident. Hmm. It examined eleven eyewitnesses which comprises of six of the seven survivors of the plane. Two doctors who attended no. Netaji, two ground engineers who were at the airport, 
and uh, interpreter who was brought in Nakamura. So these were the eleven eyewitnesses which Shanahas Committee could uh, examine. Hmm. Then the Kosla Commission was held twenty-five to twenty-nine years after the incident, Later. and they could interview four of Netaji's co-passengers and five eyewitnesses to the crash. And the Mukherjee Commission constituted furthest removed from the time of the incident, 55 to 60 years after the incident, interviewed just one eyewitness, Dr. Yoshimi, who was then over 90 years old. Besides them, the Allied forces, the Japanese and the Taiwanese, uh, they interviewed some more eyewitnesses, the nurses mm -hmm. and the crematorium staff. Yeah. Okay. So uh, let us now come to the issues, you know, which are raised by those who believe that Netaji did not die in 1945. Now, how will you respond to the doubters who say that there are too many discrepancies in the statements given by the various witnesses? There are inconsistencies regarding the time of landing and, take, and taking off from uh, Taihoku Airport of the ill-fated aircraft, and there are discrepancies, as uh, you said that uh, Suresh both also mentioned about the time of death. Why is that? There have, of course, been certain inconsistencies in the depositions of survivors of the crash and eyewitness. For example, who was sitting where in the plane? Were there hmm. 13 or 14 passengers in the plane? What was the precise arrival and departure time in Taiyuku? What was the plane's height when the explosion occurred? At which precise time did both pass away? These, as you have mentioned today. Mm. Evidence under oath to Khan committee was, as I told you, 11 years after the episode. Yeah. And the Costa Commission, uh, 25 to 29 years. The memories had faded. But these discrepancies do not falsify the story of the cash. They are due to the passage of time and the memory of witnesses becoming somewhat vague regarding matters of detail. But despite the inconsistencies, there was no disagreement whatsoever among the deponents on the fact of both meeting with the crash, dying at the military hospital, his cremation and the movement of his remains to Tokyo, and resting at Renkoji Temple. On the other hand, a completely consistent deposition by witnesses from different countries and different walks of life, and mm. after so many years, would have meant a tutored and corrupted evidence. Another thing to remember on the time matter, the passengers in the plane, in the plane they hail from different time zones, some from Philippines, some from Singapore, and others from Saigon. Their times vary plus 7.30 hours to 9.00 hours with GMT. There were local times in some places also. Each were carrying their own time. None, I'm sure, adjusted their watches to Formosa time as they were just passing through Taiyoku. So a difference mm. of one and a half years, two hours is quite obvious. Now, okay. who issued, now, the, 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 the doubters also question that who issued the death certificate. And they also say that, uh, you know, they also ask that some Ishiro Okura's death certificate was passed off as that, as that of Netaji's. See, deposition by Dr. Yoshimi, the CMO, tells us he issued the death certificate on the 18th, 9th itself hmm. in the name of Chandra Bose and the cause of death as burns of the third degree. The body was next day taken for loading in a plane to be taken to Tokyo. But hmm. it was returned as the coffin was too big to enter the plane. Then it was decided to cremate the body in Taiyoku. Hmm. The other doctor, Dr. Shuruta, told Cornell Figures in 1946, the Figures report, the third report which I am talking about, I talked about, and to the Japanese investigative team of 1955, that is the fifth report which I talked about, that he was asked to issue a death certificate for the purpose of cremation and to give some other name, name other than Chandra Bose, as they hmm. would not, the local uh, Japanese at Taihoku, ta Taiwan, Formosa, they would not like to take the responsibility to declare Bose's death. So Dr. Suruta signed the death certificate on 21st August. He mm. died on 18th, but Suruta signed the death certificate on 21st August and gave the name of Ichiro Okura. 
No. And the same, his given name was available at the cremation register. But, you know, surprisingly, Suruta, uh, uh, Dr. Suruta, to the Shana's committee report, he surprisingly said he did not issue any death certificate. So these are the confusions that are still there. Okay. And they also yeah. say that the cremation... But, no, they, they all, I, I tell you, the, what, what is con confirming, hmm. in response to a government query, the Japanese ambassador in Taiwan in 1956 clarified uh, what I was telling. As the death of Subhash Chandra Bose was kept strictly confidential by the Japanese army at Formosa at that time, it is believed that this cremation permit on Ichiro Okura must correspond to the case of late Subhash Bose. And you know, all the hospital records were taken, uh, the, both the doctors said, were brought over to the military headquarters in Tokyo, but none of the inquiry commission, uh, the team that gave, they inquired at the uh, military headquarters at to Tokyo for all these certificates. Mm. Okay. Then they also said that the cremation registered, uh, you know, the cremation registered also doesn't have the name of Subhash Chandra Bose. Yeah. Uh, I, I already mentioned, Bose's yeah. name is not in the cremation register for the reasons I've given you, exactly. the lo lo local listing. But two other persons of the total six dead, I mean, the six persons died. Three died inside the plane. They were completely burned. They were, only the bones were there and the entrails were there. Mm -hmm. They were not required to be taken to the hospital or to the any cremation. They, everything yeah. was finished off over there. But three persons were taken to the hospital. That was Netaji Bose. And two other, uh, two other of the uh, six. So, uh, one named uh, Dr. Suruta names him something like the Ishida or something like that. He died a few weeks later, and then the assistant pilot Ayogi died on 29 September in a different hospital. But Justice Mukherjee couldn't find their names because oh. they died. Uh, they because Justice Mukherjee check the uh, cremation register up to 27th August. And these mm. two persons died well after that. One died a month after that. So uh, from where do these <laughs> doubters also, on what basis do they say that the CIA records until 19, uh, you know, uh, show that until 1964, Netaji was alive? Oh, that is incorrect. Huh. By 1946, the Allied forces were certain that Netaji is no more. Hmm. CIA documents between 1946 and 48 on, on different categories, Indian radical left parties, notes on Sarat Chandra Bose, notes on forward block. Those things were declassified in 2000, the CIA record. Everywhere hmm. they refer Subhash Bose as the late leader. And the supposed CIA records of 1964 telling Netaji is alive is nothing but a twisted information. The Shoilomari Sadhu episode was at its peak at that time, in early 60s. And they just assimilated what was coming out from the Indian press. Mm. There was no findings from their side on the issue. The CIA records, if possible, we will show you. Of 1948, 1946, that they referred Netaji as dead in Indochina in the autumn of 1945. Now, you know, now uh, as you had mentioned about the uh, Justice uh, Mukherjee Commission, now this was constituted in 1999 when Netaji would have been 102 years old. And now you have exposed glaring holes in this report, which was submitted in 2005 after six long years of work. As you mentioned, this uh, report concluded that Netaji did not die in the plane crash. And the report was trashed by the government. Now, do you think that Justice Mukherjee just did a shoddy job or did he have some ulterior motive in negating the findings of the previous commissions that have consistently concluded that Netaji died after the plane crash? Good that you have asked this question, which I left unfinished before. Hmm. I would not publicly say that he had some ulterior motive as that is speculation. Okay. But I can confidently say he did a shoddy job. Mm. And there are a number of reasons, rather his drawbacks for me to say. Some of them are detailed out in the action tape, take, in report submitted in the parliament before rejecting the report. If you have time, let me serialize the drawbacks. 
one is the justice mukaji was one i would say justice mukaji was prudent and have to say if really there was a plane crash the news about the same would have been published in the then local daily mm. so he checked up central daily news the name of the paper central daily news which carried no report on any plane crash at taihuku in late august 1945 this was justice mukaji's first big mistake mm. he assumed that the central daily news was a local daily of taihuku in 1945 he never took into consideration the central daily news was chiang kai shek's paper no, an no. arch enemy of japan and so the paper was being published from mainland china not from taiwan <laughs> it became a local newspaper of tai- taiwan taipei mm. only in 1945 after chiang kai shek was driven away to taiwan justice mukaji referred to a wrong newspaper and failed to find evidence the of the crash this fundamental flaw led him towards further erroneous conclusion say in 1956 the harin shah general harin shah which i am talking about before yeah deposed deposed to the saunas committee sharing mm. the names of two, two local dailies the names are i think uh, taiwan dd shimpao and uh, taiwan nichi nichi shim why pardon me if my uh, uh, names are wrong one was a japanese newspaper local newspaper of uh, uh, taihoku and the other was a chinese newspaper mm. which had published news of bosses death due to the plane crash shah and another japanese witness also mentioned that a small obituary notice appeared in the paper and uh, the contents of the uh, of those news are in the shanawas committee report this shanawas committee report was available to justice mukaji yet he never examined these newspapers not even mentioned about its existence in that report mm. the next one about the justice mukaji is that he uh, is the same as uh, suresh boshe that he writes that as testified by habibur rahman to the shanawas committee the plane nose dive from a height of 12 to 14000 feet mm. and if that is so habibur was bluffing as seven of the 13 passenger could not have survived okay. if the plane had fallen from that height okay. but the fact is habibur never said anything like that to any committee ever mm. other he had said that he, they were flying at 12 to 14000 feet from torren to taihoku oh. the previous flight previous flight uh, not after taking off from taihoku but justice mukherjee just cherry picked this figure 12 to 14000 feet and pasted it on the height of the nose diving plane mm-hmm. and accused rahman was his closest confidant of mm-hmm. making out a story then his another legal this thing he he the taiwanese minister informed in 2003 that taiwan was under japanese occupation in august 45 mm-hmm. and the they were the japanese were there till 25th august, uh, october of 45 while leaving the island they took away most of the civil and military record from the leftover record they could find nothing that supports plane crash in august 45 so to justice mukaji what happened absence of evidence of plane crash in limited records became an evidence of absence of plane crash mm. this is unpart i mean a legal person i don't know what to say mm. the other thing is justice mukaji summarized that netaji's death was fake the plan was engineered by the japanese authority the two doctors abibur rahman and ayar but mukaji mm. does not give any evidence how such plan was engineered before beforehand i mean it's the post war chaos when the actors were scattered in tokyo taihoku and saigon so he makes official so he makes official a conspiracy theory okay but the real mystery is just yes, mukherji has meticulously visited the archives of in russia but he never queried the japanese government for anything meaningful despite netaji being last seen with them he interviewed just one person in japan he made no attempt to access the five netaji files still kept secret in japan the mystery is why justice mukherjee was so casual in japan 
on your query about the ulterior motive of, with the ulterior motive i just want to tell you that the government had authorized given full powers to mukherjee to conduct dna test of the remains hmm. at rinkoji temple the chief priest agreed through a letter to give the oh. remains for dna testing huh. but mukherjee dilly dallied and put the blame on the chief priest for not giving the remains wrongly blamed him and to to support his own action he placed a doctored translation of the chief priest letter in the mukherjee commission report by oh. excluding the key part of the chief chief priest letter written in japanese see the government wanted to get the dna test done but mukherjee scuttled it Hmm. Now, in your book, you've written, uh, despite ten investigations coming to the same conclusion, story after fantastic story of Beta Ji living after nineteen forty-five kept piling up. Many people, including some of his, uh, some of Beta Ji's family, would not accept the findings. Now, you've mentioned uh, Suresh Bose. Who else from Beta Ji's family did not uh, accept the findings? i would uh, naming uh, i don't know while a section of the bose family understood and accepted netaji's death in plate crash i would like to place it this way the main reason what i could understand from the public statements and what i could deduce why many in the family did not accept the findings on the plane crash was mostly sentimental hmm. their reasoning is guided more by the opinion of the seniors the predecessors i don't know how much individually they studied of the lately revealed records the declassified file as regarding sarath bose the netaji's elder brother hmm. during his lifetime he did not see any result of any investigations or inquiry hmm. which established netaji's death all that he got were hearsay and gossip in his letter to emily in 1948 he only spoke of his feeling that subhash was alive never mm. at any time did sarath say he knew or had evidence that subhash was alive though mm. the headline of his newspaper the nation stated that netaji was in red china the subheading if you look at it said that government knows it and he clarified in the detailed news report you should read he clarified that though he had no information about netaji he had this belief that netaji was alive and he further so uh, and he adds he must con- uh, truly says it will be futile to search for him and he may be noted that he started making arrangements to set up a this is important he started making uh, arrangements to set up a netaji museum <coughs> at what is now called the netaji bhavan would he be setting yeah. up netaji museum had he knew that netaji yeah. is somewhere alive the same with emily emily though she dearly hoped and prayed that subhas could return one one day she never had any definite information that subhas was alive similar to sarath bose she totally believed the news of netaji's death when she first heard the news over the radio this is documented in a letter to the common irish friend mrs woods in january 46 then of course later emotion must have taken over to believe mm. that netaji may still be alive it is true that ashoknath amyanath subrata and so or and soilaj bos none accepted the plane crash mm. and it and it is equally true that none accepted the soilomari sadhu or gumnami baba story Okay. and they all lived well beyond 1985 when gumnami baba died supposed to have died but the most important fact is none of them had any idea of the six investigations carried out by the allied powers which established netaji's death for sure in plane crash resulting in their giving up the chase to nab netaji the most uncompromising leader among the indians but today we are much informed after declassification of all netaji files in india russia uk usa germany and australia see netaji did not return after 95 nor has anyone any recognized authority established 
that he died in any other way at any other time or in any other place. The world recognized, Japan recognizes his death in Taiyoku in 1945. Only some Indians, that too, mostly Bengali, mm. refused to accept the truth and thus doing great harm to this leader of the leader, his stature, by giving license to generate obnoxious stories like Gumnami Baba. So let's come to Gumnami Baba. You know, that's one of the tall tales that really caught on, you know, of Netaji having become a sadhu and taking the identity of Gumnami Baba. Now your book is titled uh, Netaji is Gumnami, uh, India's Biggest Hoax. So can you just briefly tell us about this hoax? See, Gumnami Baba is no tall tale. Tall tale was Shaulamadi Sadhu of the 60s, ah, yes, which I am witness to. Parliament debated the issue for days and over a large span of time. The CIA made note of the developments in India. You will find n number of government files on the on Shoilomari among the declassified files. And in mm. contrast, there is not a single file on Gumnam. It was never discussed in Parliament. Gumnam was never discussed in Parliament. Perhaps not even in UP Assembly. Gumnami is a mole hill. See, Gumnami started with a Hindi newspaper of Faisabad in UP, dashing out the news on 28th October 1985. That one Gumnami Baba was living there and who died 42 days ago on 16 September was none other than Netaji Subhash. Some other newspapers also soon picked up the story and their story says Netaji did not die in the crash. Mm. He faked death and stayed on its... Uh, and they say that he stayed on in Saigon, where Ho Chi Minh was his host. He helped mm-hmm. the Vietnamese in the war against the French. From there, he went to China mm-hmm. and then to the USSR in '46. There, Stalin, in, the, in their books, you find. There, there, Stalin interned him in a gulag for some time, but he managed to gain the confidence of the Russian leadership and they allowed him to move to China. And he established a secret base in Central Asia from for some top secret work for the welfare of the world in general, but India in particular. But what welfare he showered on the people of the world and to Indians in particular is yet to be known. Then they say he became a great friend of Mao, Mao Zedong, and devised strategies to help Mao defeat his enemies and gain power. Mao in return was loyal to him and helped him to move to India, traversing the Himalayas, all fairy mm. tales. Then yeah. he organized the Tibetan Revolution, disguised as the leader of the Kampa tribe, which is yeah. East Tibet, whereas uh, Dalai Lama came down from West Tibet, and helped Dalai Lama to take refuge in India. He also helped the North Vietnamese in their war against US imperialism. He advised Ho Chi Minh to drop truckloads of cocaine among the American troops, mm. drugging the American GIs and causing the US to lose the war. And he also played a significant role in the liberation of Bangladesh by training the Mukti Bani. He did, wow. did everything for everyone, but mm. not for Indians. None of the above narratives stand scrutiny. There is no established evidence that Netaji escaped the plane crash. There is no evidence that he stayed with Ho Chi Minh or helped Vietnam in the wars against France or the US. Neither the Vietnamese history nor the US or French history records Netaji's or any such clandestine activity in Vietnam post-1945. The Gumnami tale is such a fantasized one, there is no clear-cut story when <laughs> how and from Gumnami entered India, if at all. But why did, I mean, just six years ago, in 2016, I mean, the government uh, constituted this high commission, you know, to, 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 to uh, investigate whether Gumnami Baba was uh, uh, Netaji. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so why did they do that? See, that, uh, that was uh, in response to a court order, Allahabad High Court court order, to find out uh, who this Umnami was. So they directed the UP government and UP government constituted the Sahai Commission huh. in 2016. The commission was in session for uh, over a year. Yeah. During this period, only 35 witnesses turned up. Can you imagine? There was so much hallabula, uh, but only 35 witnesses turned up to depose, and among them, most of them were Gumnamis, another 10 to affidavit. One of the principal advocates of the Gumnami story confessed to the Sai Commission 
on cross examination the impediments which come in the way to vouch for gumnami as netaji and these impediments he lists out as that gumnami throws three variations each being difficult to reconcile with the other one is someone gumnami is someone who was a high level international covert player going around the world advising numerous multinational negotiation second he was a highly attained tantric with supernatural powers and third picture of gumnami is a person who lived in abject poverty suffering from ill health from 1960 onward and he was wheelchair bound this proponent could not explain how a man who claimed he was helping covert military and diplomatic operations of the anti imperialist bloc in different parts of the world and who claimed to have played a pivotal role in the 1962 india china war 1965 india pakistan war and 1971 bangladesh liberation right. was able was not able to fend for himself properly if gumnami then he himself says if gumnami was indeed netaji he would have been able to give insights of how he escaped from russia in 1945 and details of the journey from russia to india and whatever is given by the others on the sketchy information and cannot be used to connect the dots gumnami's many claims are not supported by anything everything is done substantiated the very idea that netaji could live secretly in hiding in such a wretched condition in his own country for such a long time is absolutely impossible this is what the chief proponent finally surrendered to the sahay commission but let me also now, sorry go ahead carry on no uh, now sahay commission i think presented its findings in 2017 correct ha ah, yeah. okay here but now nevertheless a book comes out in 2019 just 3 years ago title uh, a conundrum subhash bose's life after death it's authored by uh, chandrachur ghosh and anush das they cite an american handwriting expert who concluded that bose and gumnami baba are the same person this expert carl baggett reached his conclusion after studying hundreds of letters written by bose and gumnami baba now here i quote the times of india now this is from the times of india baggett is an authority on document examination with over 40 years of experience and has completed over 5000 cases certified by the american bureau of document examiners baggett has testified as an expert witness in handwriting in all states in the us he was given two sets of letters to analyze without being told the identities of the writer after he said they were written by the same man it was revealed to him that the person in question was netaji bose baggett stood by his conclusion and gave a signed statement to that effect unquote now the authors of the book look what they say they say it's possible that bose suffered from psychological trauma perhaps because of torture and russian captivity which may have forced him to remain in hiding and assume the identity of gumnami baba so what do you have to say to this as okay, this person i think is kurt bagger and not uh uh, uh yeah. that reports is uh, that uh, bagger says ha uh, okay first one must know that handwriting expertise that is graphology uh. is a pseudo science and not a tool for identification anywhere in the world the supreme if you uh, I'll quote from supreme court supreme court of india has clearly categorized that handwriting evidence is the weakest type of evidence thus opinion on handwriting by handwriting expert is non scientific mm. and being a non scientific expert often give conflicting opinion and it is highly unsafe to pass any conviction on such type of evidence unless this is very important the expert steps into a witness box for cross examination and unless he steps into uh, his cross examination by the court his written opinion has no value mm. handwriting evidence being weak the court has power to examine the handwriting itself and opinion of the handwriting expert being the weakest type is unreliable unless 
supported by other independent evidence. The opinion of Kurt Baggett is a procured one. Mm. It has no locus standi and it is not vetted legally. The proponents of Gumnami are good at doing such things. Earlier, when the Mukherjee Commission was in session, they similarly procured, procured a positive opinion from a private handwriting expert, a similarly private handwriting expert, by appointing him through a media house. Now, keeping aside the legality for the timing, Baggett has given his unverified opinion on only the English writings of Gumnabi. But no. what about Gumnabi's claimed Bengali handwriting? It is shown in my book. There is not an iota of similarity or resemblance between Gumnami's and Shubhas's writing style, pattern, and spelling. These are there in my book. Do you know what explanation these people give no. to these vast dissimilarities between the two handwritings? Mm. They say that Gumnami deliberately used to write in a different style so that his identity is not revealed. So he could confuse people. Mm. That means he, he confused everybody, even the government expert, but could not uh, confuse Baggett. Uh, and yeah, yeah. the other experts appointed privately by them. Marvelous. <laughs> in a nutshell, in re response to your question, in the absence of any legal acceptance, Kurt Baggett's opinion is not worth a dime. Yeah. Now you have let's, let, uh, so let's continue in the present now. And uh, yeah, uh, just to conclude this conversation also. Now, yes. Uh, you also must have experienced this. You know, some people are of the view that uh, Jawaharlal Nehru and the successive Congress governments have allowed, you know, have sort of elbowed out Netaji and the INA from the history books. You know, they've sought, they've sought to uh, bury their contribution to the freedom struggle. What are you, your views on this? This is a political question. Whereas my study has been on the fake stories on Netaji's death. Hmm. But as you have asked, as a general public, I can say yeah. Netaji has not got his due from successive government in many ways. The allowing of these fake stories, insulting remarks about his wife and daughter are some of the issues which the government can easily take care of. Hmm. That is my response. Now, uh, for the last 77 years, the Japanese have respectfully looked after the remains of Netaji at the Renkoji Temple in Tokyo. Is it time to bring back Netaji's remains to India? See, Netaji's ambition was to return to an independent India. Circumstances did not let it happen. The best way to honor his wishes in this 125th anniversary year is to bring his remains by 18th August to response uh, to sort of repose on Indian soil. And India government can do it. If technically possible, a DNA test may be conducted. His daughter, Dr. Anita Puff, will thus get the opportunity to perform the pending rituals for the departed soul. And thereby she and we too can fulfill her father's dream of Delhi Chalo and complete his journey from Renkoji to Redport. Excellent, excellent. Thank you so much to Meru. Uh, Shout to all of you. Uh, and thank you very much, Shumeruji, for your very erudite and uh, extensive um, explanation of the situation. Uh, I concur with you on practically everything that you said. So I will not go into repeating anything of, of that sort. I would... Uh, if I'm permitted, uh, like to make a few comments, not only regarding my own attitudes uh, in um, uh, relation to what Sumeruji told us. Um, number one is the uh, fact that uh, many of the uh, investigations regarding my father's death uh, became available much later. Uh, first of all, I think it's absolutely uh, logical that the, that Great Britain uh, and the United States at the end of the Second World War uh, tried to investigate the whereabouts of my father, uh, since I think he was probably the most hated 
uh, of the uh, top leadership uh, of the independence movement in Great Britain at the time. Uh, and it was certainly of some relevance what would have happened to him. Uh, I'm sure that uh, Great Britain was relieved that he uh, did die because it, uh, he would have uh, been able to create some troubles for them. And on top of that, I think uh, they would have landed themselves into a very, in, in, in a very difficult uh, position if he had survived. Uh, how do they deal with him? Do they execute him uh, after a court martial or what do they do? Do they create uh, uh, even more uh, iconic uh, uh, hero by executing him and making him uh, the sacrificial goat, so to say, in, in this whole uh, game. Uh, they must have been quite relieved that uh, he was dead. And uh, I think if they had not been convinced that uh, the reports uh, were reliable, they would have uh, continued to investigate and to do something about this. Um, What we uh, have to keep in mind about uh, the situation politically and uh, as far as the technological development was concerned, uh, the Second World War ended in uh, August of 1945 in the Eastern Theater of War. And uh, the capitulation of Japan, particularly the uh, announcement by the emperor uh, to the Japanese people that they would uh, capitulate uh, was absolutely traumatic for Japan. And we cannot consider the situation a normal one at, uh, for Japan at that time. Japan was uh, eventually getting out of many of the occupied areas, including uh, Taiwan. Uh, during the next few months and um, a major change took place. So I think we can't be very surprised that not everything was documented to the last dot and not all the documentation was kept and was still available. Uh, apart from that, if we consider uh, eyewitness reports on totally different events, we always have the uh, experience that there are slight deviations on things like the exact time and so on. Sumeruji so pointed out uh, uh, the discrepancies and I think he rightfully pointed out that they were rather minor. Um, the second thing we have to keep in mind, which I think also throws light on the um, uh, Mukherjee uh, Commission report is the fact that we do not have a, a sort of linear um, uh, continuation of developments in that uh, area. Uh, as Sumeruji pointed out, uh, Japan uh, was occupying Taiwan uh, until uh, 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 the time shortly after the Second World War. Uh, then uh, there was sort of a interregnum situation and the present uh, government only came into power in 1949. So during that period, we do not necessarily have a complete continuation of uh, documentation and so on. In fact, uh, somebody uh, mentioned to me uh, in connection with the claim of the Mukherjee report that there was no evidence of a plane crash, that he had very clearly gotten the information, was a diplomat, uh, an Indian diplomat, I got the information that uh, such a plane crash took place, but they didn't have the written evidence of that. Uh, the next aspect is to whom would my father have uh, tried to, with whom would he have tried to get in touch with? I mean, there were two people who probably were closest to him. One was my uncle Sharad and the other one was my mother. Uh, I think it would have been totally logical that he would have tried to get in touch with his brother because his first love and his first commitment in, uh, during his life was India and India's freedom. And there was still quite a bit to be done on that issue in 1945. 
so he would have tried to uh, be in touch with him once my um, uncle was released. In fact, there is some indication that he was released because uh, Shubhaj was considered uh, to be dead. Uh, he could not have gotten in touch with my mother at the time, even if he had wanted at that stage, because the situation after the end of the Second World War was very different. We did uh, technologically anyway, we did not have any WhatsApp and so on. But even writing a letter was a difficult thing at the time. When my mother tried to reach out towards my uncle Sharad in 1946 to inform him about our whereabouts, she sent him a letter. And the only way she could send it at the time was by ordinary mail and it never reached him. Then after some months, she, she sent the letter again. And by then she could write a letter by airmail, which was a great improvement already. So what I want to point out is it, it's not, it was not that easy to communicate with uh, each other at the time. And even though he would have been keen to communicate with his brother regarding the situation in India, on top of everything else, it uh, certainly would still have been uh, quite dangerous at the time. So that he would have been in hiding if he had survived, it's clear. Uh, if we think of the fact that three uh, important uh, officers of the Indian National Army were put on trial at the Red Fort and, uh, and sentenced, but the public uh, pressure, uh, of course, saved their lives, so to say. Now, uh, one aspect uh, which may puzzle some of us is why did Sharat and also Shuresh, the two brothers of my father who were involved in, in this uh, controversy later on about uh, his death, uh, believe that he was still alive. I think Shumeroji had a very good point in saying it was an emotional matter. It definitely was for Sharat because I... Uh, uh, wish to point out that he, uh, that Sharad was privy to one of the investigations that you mentioned. That was the uh, invest, the private investigation by Ayn Shah. And uh, Shah met uh, my uncle in Prague in 1948, and he uh, gave him uh, the story of his investigation. And you have to keep in mind, my uncle was very sick at the time. Uh, he had been in prison for many years. He, he was a heart patient and eventually at the age of 60 uh, died of a heart failure. And uh, so when Shah told him the story, he was absolutely devastated. And uh, my cousin, uh, Dr. Shishir Bose, his son who was present during that interview uh, said, the story was convincing, but when he saw the situation his father was in, he said, oh, most likely it isn't true anyway, because he was just worried about his father who, uh, that he might die then and there. Uh, so he had, give, had been given that evidence, but he clung to the hope that his brother had survived. You have to keep in mind, these two brothers were very, very close, quite unusually so. Um, my mother was devastated when she got the news uh, of my father's death uh, on radio. Uh, and of course, she kept hoping, well, he disappeared and uh, under mysterious circumstances before, maybe once again, that was the case. And um, sort of kept hoping that he might live. So when my uncle wrote to her, I have a feeling that my brother is alive. It's nothing more than a feeling. Uh, I can, can't quote the exact, uh, thought, but the idea was he very clearly said he did not have any definite knowledge, but he felt that his brother was alive. She sort of clung to that hope again and, and renewed. And um, eventually I think the, since uh, there was no evidence and, and no getting in touch that he was alive. She sort of gave up the hope on that. Um, but uh, let me add one more thing about uh, sightings. Uh, there was a, a Hindu monk, Swami Agenanda Bharati, who was also uh, asked by people uh, several times whether he was Netaji. 
uh, and you have to know he was actually uh, Austrian by uh, origin, but very fair skinned, of course, and my father was fair skinned too. So people thought uh, this monk uh, with shaven hair and uh, fair skin might be Netaji, but he happened to be 80, uh, uh, 80 inches taller. So he kept telling people, look here, I'm eight inches taller than Netaji. How can I be Netaji? And so some people would answer, oh, it would be no problem for Netaji to grow another eight inches. This is just an anecdote to tell you how irrational people are uh, regarding such situations. Uh, and um, the evidence of the plane crash is, I think, overwhelming. Uh, everything else, as Sumeroji pointed out, is just speculation, might have been, could have been, uh, possibly uh, was or something. It's, it's just speculation and hope in essence. And maybe one more aspect for some people throughout this whole period of the controversy, it was also ulterior motives. There were some people who for their own reason had, a, had, had interest in his being alive uh, and keeping this myth alive. So um, last thing, Justice Mukherjee, I don't understand why and how this could have happened. I imagine uh, justice of his position and all that would be working um, carefully and uh, and uh, really bound to tell the truth. But Sumeruji pointed out there was a lot of shoddy work in that. Uh, one has to keep in mind, uh, he also came to the conclusion that he was in uh, Taihoku or Taiwan um, uh, on the 18th of August, 1945. But he says there is no written evidence of uh, the plane crash. Um, and uh, we don't know what happened to him. So this is a rather inconclusive thing, but uh, the inconsistencies between the appendi uh, appendices to the, an annexes to the report itself and the report are puzzling. Uh, I can't imagine why the, uh, he as a justice knowingly would have assigned his name to a report which had clearly showed up to be inconsistent with, with the material the, the report was uh, supposed to be based on. This is strange, let's put it that way. Uh, how did I come to terms with it? How do I come to terms with it now is maybe more important. Uh, I'm going to be 80 this year. Uh, so I can expect not to live on that many years to come. And I would like to have closure on that issue. And as you pointed out before, Cholodili was his uh, slogan and uh, the dedication to his um, motherland was most important. So it was certainly a wish to be in free India, even though free India wasn't what he imagined it to be. The, the partition of India, I think, would have been a terrible thing. And we can only speculate whether he and Mahatma Gandhi together might have found a different solution. That's all mute to uh, speculate about it now. But uh, at least I think in a symbolic way, it, uh, it would be a justification if his remains could be brought back uh, to India. And uh, I think he has sacrificed so much, uh, maybe even more than many of the other top leaders of the independence movement. So he certainly would deserve to come back home. Uh, thank you very much, Jai Hind. There is an intriguing question by our good friend Ismat Meji. Uh, maybe Anita can answer it. Netaji was given a trunk containing gold to enable him to carry his work further. 
has any inquiry been convincingly made about the gold that has Nirtaji was given? Uh, not to my uh, knowledge. Uh, yeah. Possibly it was not so surprising that he was ca carrying gold because uh, uh, the Indians in Southeast Asia had donated a lot of jewelry and so on. So for some reason, maybe for further political work, it was taken along, but I have no idea what happened to it. Sumeruji maybe has investigated more about it. Yes, ma'am. Uh, uh, actually, these were, as uh, Dr. Anita has said, uh, these were donated by the Indians in Southeast Asia. And uh, he was very particular about keeping uh, this thing, uh, this treasure uh, with him. So when he was uh, leaving Bangkok on the 17th, he took four trunk loads of uh, the jewelry and all this treasure uh, with him. But finally, uh, he could take only, he left two trunks in Saigon and he could mm -hmm. take only two trunks, uh, mm -hmm. two bags rather, uh, two bags full of treasures with him. So the treasures weighed roughly, the water had assessed from various uh, sources what they had, the treasures. Uh, he, weigh, uh, it, he was carrying, he started with some 70 odd kilogram of the treasure if in four uh, bags. Half of it he left uh, at Saigon. We do not know what happened from Saigon, those half, that is uh, 70, 35 kg roughly. 35 kg, what happened uh, to that, we do not know. And say another 35 he was carrying. But the plane went with the crash. And what could be recovered uh, from the molten, this thing, and all mixed up stuff, uh, which came back to India via uh, Tokyo uh, through the IIL Ramuti was only 11 kg. So what happened to this 35 minus 11? Uh, I don't know, from this 35, you can say some got lost in the fire and got okay. spoiled. So what happened to this between 35 uh, minus 11 kg, that is also a mystery. That is not just solved. One is this 35 kg that got uh, missing from Saigon. Now, who were there at Saigon? Uh, that's another story. Uh, and 35 minus 11, how it got missed. So only 11 kg of the 70 odd kg came back to India. Great. Ram, you want to wind up? Uh, yes. Uh, thank you, everybody, for a fascinating discussion. This month has been very different. We normally have just one or two speakers. We've had uh, four speakers giving us different insights into uh, Netaji's uh, death and his uh, political legacy in a way. Um, thank you all for joining us.